and the other one lambda CDM with early dark energy. Okay. And so we, uh, then we'll be able to see very clearly exactly what the differences are. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. Uh, Anatoly figures that within a week uh, he'll know how much time it's going to take and we'll see if that's practical. If not, we can drop down to uh, just redoing uh, Bolshoi or maybe uh, 400 H inverse megaparsecs like a small multi dark. Like, yeah, right. Wow. That's, so that's, that's incredible. Great. <laughs> that's just great yes, and incredible. I, uh, uh, so this uh, this is I think going to be ma amazing and uh, really useful I think. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> it will require a lot of people to analyze that and working on that. <laughs> right. Too much so stuff. Peter Bruce, uh, uh has signed on. Uh, we're thinking of asking uh, Rachel Somerville to uh, fill all the halos with uh, her semi-analytic model, and of course we can also just use abundance matching. Right. Uh huh. Yeah, we'll be happy and to do that. Make it relevant for Hubble. Yes. For, especially for James Webb. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That would be great. Uh -huh. Anyway, that, that's what we're thinking of. And uh, the deadline for uh, HST proposals is next Friday, uh, March 6th. So uh, I'll get busy uh, actually writing something, and I'll, I'll be able to run some text by you uh, early next week. Yeah. Yeah, we'd be happy to, uh, to collaborate. It's kind of odd that. because this is a helpful uh, proposal. But there's no opportunity to apply to NASA's astrophysics theory program uh, this year. They're not uh, asking for uh, proposals. Uh, and this will be relevant to Hubble and also, of course, to James Webb. So we can also submit, like, uh, if we don't get it for Hubble, we can submit to James Webb. That deadline is in May. Yes, yes, yes. We actually had yeah, our way, workshop uh, on that. <laughs> it'll be helpful to get some money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, when you submit uh, these proposals, you don't even include a budget. Uh, you only do that if they say that they like the science. Mm -hmm. So this is just a scientific proposal, so you don't have to go through uh, any of the, you know, getting signatures. Uh, so it's easy to, to submit. Yes. And uh, and uh, I think this will be sufficiently interesting that there's a chance that we can get this as a Hubble. And that way, that'll uh, give me uh, access to NASA's computing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yep. uh, so thanks for uh, participating. Uh, it's kind of a natural thing to do. OK, when <laughs> yep. do we start? Yes, uh, actually, we have uh, a lot of people coming to the uh, colloquium. So I think it's time to start. So I will start with a, a brief summary of Joel's career, which is very extensive. But I will just mention a few things. So uh, Joel, Joel is a distinguished professor of physics emeritus at the University of California in Santa Cruz. Joel received his AB from Princeton University in 1966 and his PhD from Stanford University in 1970. Uh, uh, Joel was a junior fellow of the Society of Fellows, Harvard University and, and from 1970 to 73. And he was also a uh, APS Loan Foundation Reserve Fellowship in 1974. So Joel specializes in the formation and evolution of galaxy and the nature of dark matter. But initially, he worked in the field of particle physics, where he made uh, significant contributions to the standard model. So in 1982, in a paper with Heinz uh, Pagels, uh, was the first to propose that uh, a natural candidate for dark matter is the lightest supersymmetric particle. In 1994, Joel, uh, with George Blumenthal, Sandra Faber, and Martin Rees, wrote, uh, wrote one of the most influential papers of the structure formation in the universe. Uh, that 84. was 84, uh, right. What, what I said? All dark matter paper. Uh, OK, 84, sorry, 84. So, uh, and, um, which uh, has become the basis for the standard model picture of the structure formation in the universe, the Lambda CDM, <clears throat> and the standard for uh, studying galaxy formation. Um, and with the support from the National Science Foundation, NASA, and the Department of Energy, he's been using supercomputers to uh, simulate and visualize the evolution of the universe and the formation of galaxies under various assumptions in comparing th the prediction of this theory to the latest observational data. Uh, he organized and led the University uh, of California System-wide Center for High-Performance uh, Astrocomputing, HIPAC, from 2010-2015. So Joel has more than 200 publications in scientific journals which can be cited around 30,000 times. <laughs> in addition to his many publications in scientific journals, Joel co-authored a book on science um, and public um, 
and, and public policy with Frank uh, von Hippel, advice and dissident scientists in the political arena in 1974, as well as two popular books on modern cosmology and implications for how we think about global problems, both co-authored with his wife, Nancy um, Abrams. Um, one is the view from the center of the universe, discovering our extraordinary place in the cosmos in 2006, and the nature uh, and the new universe, universe and the human future for, sorry, and the new universe and the human future, how uh, a shared cosmology could be transformed the world in 2011. He was, uh, he has also written many popular articles and given many lectures for general public. So he has also several prizes. Uh, uh, he has the Fellow of the American Physical Society of the American Association for the Advance, Advancement of uh, Science for pioneering uh, contributions to gauge theory in cosmology, and the, <clears throat> and the California Academy of Science for pioneering efforts in the establishment uh, in the establishment of the AAS. A Congressional Science Fellow Program and for dedication to expanding the use of science in policy making through government. He has also the Alex, Alexander Ford Humboldt Foundation Senior Award in 1999, uh, the American Physics Society Leo uh, Szilard uh, Lectureship Award in, in 2016 for helping establish the uh, Congressional Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. Uh, he was also president of the Sigma uh, he, uh, the, uh, the scientific research on our society. Uh, he chaired the Forum of Physics and Society of the American Physics Society. And recently, this is very recent, in 2020, uh, the American uh, Physical Society, Julius Edgar Lilienfeld, uh, uh, for his seminal contributions of, uh, to our understanding of the formation of a structure in the universe and communicating and for communicating to the public uh, the extraordinary progress in understanding of cosmology. So um, I think that's it. <laughs> it was a very, <laughs> very long description. But um, yeah, so whenever you are ready, please jump. OK, let's get going. Uh, I have to uh, apologize in advance that I need to leave uh, about uh, a little over an hour from now uh, for another appointment. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll try to go through the talk pretty fast uh, and unfortunately, there won't be a lot of time for questions. Maybe we can uh, organize another opportunity to, for discussion if people are interested. Anyway, uh, why galaxies start pickle shape? Uh, it's a, a, a curious outline. Uh, so I want to explain in advance. I'm first going to talk about the evidence for modern cosmology, in particular, uh, lambda CDM, which we call the double dark theory, dark matter and dark energy. Uh, and then observational evidence that galaxies are not disks and not spheroids, but they start looking like little pickles, as the image at the top of the screen shows. Then a little bit of history, and uh, I confess that I am especially emphasizing my contributions to the history uh, of dark matter and cosmology. Uh, and then a little bit on galaxy formation, and then finally the explanation of why galaxies start shaped like pickles and then how they evolve. So that's the structure of the talk to start with evidence for modern cosmology. So the first evidence for dark matter was discovered in the 1930s by Fritz Wicke and others, but it wasn't until about 1980 that astronomers became convinced that most of the mass holding galaxies and clusters of galaxies together is invisible. Uh, for two decades, there were alternative theories, but by about 20 years ago, the Lambda CDM double dark standard cosmological model was accepted by almost all astronomers, and it's the basis for essentially all modern work on cosmology and galaxy formation. Lambda CDM correctly predicts the cosmic background radiation and the large scale distribution of galaxies, but we now need to understand the physics of dark matter and dark energy and how they result in the universe of galaxies that we observe. So uh, this is the Hubble ultra deep field and everything you see except for uh, those three objects with uh, little uh, diffraction spikes are uh, galaxies. Those three, uh, of course, are the stars uh, in the foreground in the Milky Way. Uh, there's over 10,000 galaxies in this image. All those little dots are distant galaxies. It's beautiful, but this picture is very misleading because it only shows about half of 1% of cosmic density. The other 99.5% of the universe is invisible. 
In our popular book, uh, my wife and I use this illustration. Uh, I hope you can see that the uh, white uh, lines outline a uh, big pyramid. The bottom of the pyramid, most of the volume, about 70%, is dark energy. Above that is the cold dark matter, about 25% of the cosmic density. Ordinary matter makes up about uh, 5%, but most of it is invisible. The visible matter, mostly hydrogen and helium, is only half of 1%, as I said. And all the heavier atoms, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and so on, are formed in stars and only make about a hundredth of 1%. It's the rarest stuff in the universe, the stuff we're made of and the Earth is made of. Uh, it's even a smaller contribution to cosmic density than the neutrinos. So the matter and energy content of the universe can be summarized as dark matter ships on a dark energy ocean, but all we see are the lights on the tops of the biggest ships, the galaxies. So this is the lambda CDM or double dark theory. So why should anybody take this seriously? And the answer is that uh, back in our earliest paper uh, in, in 1983, uh, George Blumenthal and I calculated the mass variance and the power spectrum. Uh, that's this dashed curve. And uh, the data has now come in and the fit is superb. Uh, from scales smaller than galaxies, the Lyman Alpha Forest, all the way up to the biggest structures in the observed universe. And the cosmic background radiation, this is the latest uh, data, the final uh, uh, paper from uh, the Planck uh, satellite team. Uh, the blue curves are the predictions of lambda CDM uh, for the temperature angular correlation function, the temperature polarization angular correlation function and the uh, E-mode polarization uh, color, uh, angular power spectrum. Uh, every one of the points is an independent measurement and there are simply no discrepancies. They all agree as well as you'd expect with the errors uh, with the uh, Lambda CDM model. So it's a six parameter model and it does a remarkable job of fitting. There is however a problem. The problem is that if you take lambda CDM and use that to extrapolate from cosmic background radiation or other early universe measurements, you get a value of the Hubble parameter of about 67 and a half. But if you take all the recent measurements nearby out to about a gigaparsec or so, uh, which are in this diagram called late below the uh, gray dashed curve, uh, if you combine them all, you get 73.3 with an error, a statistical error of 0.8. The disagreement between that and Planck and the other early universe measurements is six sigma. And uh, that is very unlikely to be happening by some kind of statistical fluke. It may be that this is trying to tell us that there's something else that happened besides standard lambda CDM. Uh, there's a big literature on this, but uh, the thing that seems to me uh, physically plausible and easy to implement is a little episode of a small contribution of dark energy at around a, a redshift of about 3,500, just before matter dominance. And uh, only uh, it's 5% of cosmic density on average for a few thousand years. And uh, that's the solid curve on the right-hand side of the figure. Uh, the, the solid uh, uh, three curves are radiation, which of course quickly falls off with time, uh, with the uh, red, redshift decreasing. Uh, the matter contribution, which rises and dominates until recently, and then dark energy uh, becomes the dominant uh, contribution, uh, starting at about a redshift of a half. Uh, so this modifies the uh, extrapolation and avoids this tension between the different values. You get this uh, uh, bluish curve uh, that I marked EDE on the left-hand side, which then agrees with the, the recent measurements within their errors. Uh, however, uh, we've run, and in particular Anatoly Klippen has run a bunch of uh, quick simulations 
And we've seen that there are two major changes that this causes in the extrapolation. You get more early structure formation, more galaxies at high redshift, more clusters at intermediate redshift than standard lambda CDM. It's quite significant. We're talking factors of two. Uh, and it also changes the scale of baryon acoustic oscillations. It's only about a two and a half percent effect, but that should be easily measurable with the next generation of surveys. So uh, we're working out now what the modifications are uh, if we adopt this idea of early dark energy to uh, resolve the Hubble tension. And again, uh, this is observational cosmology. We're going to test every one of these things. Okay, so now observational evidence that galaxies start pickle shaped. So I'm moving on to uh, the second topic. Why do we think galaxies are pickle shaped? and not disks or spheroids. I used to think galaxies started as spheroids, uh, sorry, as disks, and then became spheroids. But that's wrong. And the reason we know it's wrong is that we now have images of many galaxies out to redshifts of about two and a half, where we're seeing the full stellar population. Thanks to Wide Field Camera 3, and this is a picture of that being installed by the astronaut on the last uh, visit to Hubble in 2009. So uh, the images at the top are of the same galaxy. The upper image is in H-band, 1.6 microns, uh, wide field camera three. The lower images are the best we could do with the advanced camera for surveys, its longest wavelength band. Uh, and there what you're seeing is rest frame ultraviolet at redshift two. These are roughly redshift two galaxies. And there you're just seeing where the new stars are forming the stars that live a few million years and put out a lot of UV light. But the upper diagram is the same galaxy, but now you're seeing the full stellar population with HST resolution. And uh, of course, what we really want is to see the same galaxy in many different wave bands. And now thanks to these two wonderful cameras, Advanced Camera for Surveys and Whitefield Camera 3, we have multiple wavelength observations of many, many galaxies, over 100,000 galaxies. Now, uh, why did we think, why did I think uh, that galaxies start as disks? Newton's law explained why planetary orbits are elliptical, but not why the planetary orbits in the solar system are nearly circular in the same plane and in the same direction as the sun rotates. And Newton answered a question from one of his colleagues by, uh, as to why this is true by saying, this is evidence for God's handiwork. In other words, he couldn't explain it. Laplace in the 1780s explained this as a consequence of angular momentum conservation as the sun and planets formed in a cooling and contracting protoplanetary gas cloud that formed a disk, like this one on the right. And uh, using the ALMA uh, radio telescope array, uh, it's been possible to see a great many of these. Here's a, a sample of 20 of them that was recently released at the end of last year. Uh, so these protoplanetary disks uh, really exist, and the gaps in them are presumably where planets are uh, absorbing the, uh, the dust and uh, the bigger planetismals and making uh, uh, planets in formation. Uh, so that's a whole separate topic, but uh, let's go back to the galaxy question. For many reasons, for similar reasons, many astronomers once thought that galaxies would start as disks. Uh, gas would contract in a dark matter halo, but uh, as it contracted, conserving angular momentum, it would rotate faster and faster and become a disk. But Hubble Space Telescope images of forming galaxies instead show that most of them are prolate, that is pickle-shaped. As we will see, this is a consequence of most galaxies forming in prolate dark matter halos oriented along massive dark matter filaments, but we won't get to that till later in the talk. So here's the paper that presented the first really convincing statistical evidence that galaxies uh, that are low mass at high redshift are mostly prolate. So uh, look in particular at the lower left of the histograms at the top of this diagram. Uh, the mass is 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 9.5, and uh, that's at uh, redshifts 
of 1.5 to 2. And what you see is that the histogram, the number of galaxies as a function of their axis ratio, the short axis over the long axis length, uh, it peaks at an axis ratio of about 0.3. In other words, the galaxies are more than three times longer than they are wide in their images. And there's very little above about 0.7. Now, if galaxies are spheroids, they're going to have an axis ratio near one. That's obviously eliminated. That's not uh, only a tiny fraction could be spheroids. Uh, the spheroids are marked green in, in this diagram. Uh, if they're disks, then we have to see them in every orientation, uh, face on, but also edge on, and everything in between. And the fact that we see hardly any large axis ratios also constrains the fraction of disks. And uh, our best estimate in this paper, based on uh, the first cut of the uh, candles data, the big candles uh, uh, survey using Hubble Space Telescope, the biggest project in the history of Hubble. Uh, our conclusion was that a majority of the galaxies uh, down to uh, a mass of 10 to the 9.5 and a redshift above one are prolate. And same for the galaxies that have a mass of 10 to the 9.5 to 10 to the 10 above redshift 1.5. Uh, we've done a reanalysis of this uh, in this paper by Hao En Zhang, a visiting Chinese student working with me, Sandy Faber, and others, uh, published last year. Uh, and uh, in this slide, I'm showing you a comparison. The upper one is the 2014 version. The lower one, where we're seeing a larger fraction of prolate galaxies, uh, is based on a more complete analysis of a more complete data set. Uh, so I think this is the one to take seriously. It also increased the spheroidal component and uh, decreased the disk component. Uh, anyway, the observational evidence is really, I think, quite striking and convincing that uh, low mass galaxies at high redshift are mostly prolate. Uh, this, is a, this slide shows uh, an indication of why the statistics allow us to determine, even though we only see two dimensions on the sky, uh, with statistics, we can deduce the third dimension. We can deduce what these things really look like in three dimensions. So if they're disky, then the axis ratio as a function of the long axis, the semi-major axis A, uh, is going to be basically a vertical line, uh, a little bit more at the, at the bottom end. Uh, if they're uh, spheroidal, uh, it's going to be largely uh, nearly... Uh, uh, spherical uh, with an axis ratio bigger than 0.5. On the other hand, if they're elongated, if we see them perpendicular to the line of sight, then they're going to have the longest major axis. And if we see them oriented along the line of sight, then of course they're going to look round. So they'll have a high axis ratio. And uh, so uh, that shows these banana shaped curves. So by looking at uh, uh, the distribution, in the actual data, we can really clarify which it is. Uh, so the next slide shows uh, the data from Hubble Space Telescope bin in, uh, so it's B over A versus log A. A is the semi-major axis, B is the semi-minor axis. And uh, what's color-coded here is attenuation. And uh, what you see is that uh, you're seeing these sort of banana-shaped patterns at high redshift and low mass at the lower left-hand corner. Mass increases to the right, redshift increases downward, and a given galaxy would evolve in the diagonal direction. In other words, mass increasing as redshift decreases. Anyway, uh, the other thing to notice here is that these edge-on galaxies, the low axis ratio, B over A small and A uh, fairly large, uh, they have hardly any attenuation. Uh, in the early universe. On the other hand, if you look at the late universe, uh, redshifts less than one, uh, look at the, uh, that red box we call late oblate. There, all the ones on the bottom, those would be the edge on disks, are heavily attenuated with uh, an AV of two or more, two magnitudes. Uh, 
So that's just what you'd expect. We're seeing the dust lanes, but we don't see anything like that in the edge on galaxies uh, that we're seeing at high redshift, indicating they're not edge on disks, they're really prolate galaxies. Okay, well, enough on that. Uh, a little bit on the history of dark matter now. So a uh, quick summary, in the 30s, uh, Zwicky and others showed that clusters have this large velocity dispersion, uh, indicating a much higher mass to hold them together than in the stars. Uh, in the 70s, uh, Vera Rubin and others flat galaxy rotation curves showing that not just uh, clusters, but also galaxies are surrounded by vast amounts of invisible matter. And most astronomers by the 19, the early 80s are convinced that dark matter exists around galaxies and clusters. For a short period, uh, the idea that the dark matter was made of neutrinos was popular, but uh, we call that hot dark matter because these particles are moving relativistically in the early universe. But uh, then uh, Peebles and Blumenthal and I and our collaborators proposed cold dark matter. And in other words, massive particles that be moving very sluggishly in the early universe. And uh, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background fluctuations in different directions in the sky by the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, COBE, in 1992, uh, showed that there were two versions of cold dark matter that seemed to be the best. Lambda CDM and also a version with cold plus hot dark matter, about 80% uh, cold plus 20% hot. Uh, and uh, J uh, John Holtzman and I, uh, Holtzman was then my uh, PhD student, had uh, even before uh, the COBE satellite results became available in April of 1992, we had deduced from other observations that the same two models were going to be the ones that uh, looked like the best. Then uh, the discovery, uh, my slides aren't uh, advancing now. I don't know what the problem is. Ah, okay, here we go. So 1998 discovery accelerated expansion of the universe tells us that in fact, there's a lot of dark energy favoring Lambda CDM and so for the last 20 years, Lambda CDM is the standard cosmological model. And uh, many, many observations uh, from the cosmic microwave background and large scale structure, baryon acoustic oscillations, et cetera, confirm the predictions of Lambda CDM. And who knows, maybe this year or sometime soon, we may discover the nature of the dark matter. So uh, some quick highlights of the history this is a famous picture of Fritz Wicke and that uh, zero that he's making is his opinion of all other astronomers. Uh, but he showed convincingly that the mass to light ratio that's required is over a factor of a hundred larger uh, to, to explain the, how the coma cluster could be bound, uh, larger than the mass to light ratio uh, that we see nearby in, in the galaxy, the Milky Way. So a uh, hundred times as much dark matter as luminous matter and uh, that's uh, uh, consistent with the modern measurements. This is Vera Rubin, and uh, in the solid curve, you see her, get her data, and then the little triangles are data that goes out even further. This is for the Andromeda galaxy, uh, and that's based on uh, neutral hydrogen uh, radio observations by uh, Mort Roberts and his collaborator Whitehurst. And the fact that the rotation curve is flat way beyond where the stars are, <clears throat> the, the stars of, of Andromeda, that's showing that uh, uh, there's something else that's holding the material together because V squared is Newton's constant G times the mass over the radius. And if the mass were where the light is, then uh, v would be falling off as one over square root of r, but you can see the rotation velocity is constant out there. And now we know that this is true for essentially all the galaxies that we've looked at. So based on these observations and uh, some theory, uh, Simon White in his thesis work with Martin Rees in 1978 <coughs> uh, pr produced this theory that galaxies are embedded in extensive dark matter halos. Uh, and their model 
was omega of 0.2. Dark matter makes up 80% of the total mass. And uh, half the residual gas has been converted into uh, stars. Well, the numbers aren't quite the modern numbers, but the basic idea was right on. And uh, Sandy Faber and Jay Gallagher in their uh, Annual Reviews of Astronomy and Astrophysics article in 1979, they looked critically at all the papers that were on the subject of dark matter around galaxies and clusters. There were about 300 papers. There were 200 that were not completely convincing and they threw them out. But the remaining 100 were simply irrefutable. And uh, their conclusion was that the case for invisible mass in the universe is very strong and getting stronger. And it's likely that the discovery of invisible matter, dark matter, and others, will endure as one of the major conclusions of modern astronomy. And of course, that's turned out to be true. Uh, so uh, I was at UCSC. I was very impressed by Sandy's uh, uh, summary and uh, this uh, data that was very convincing. And so uh, in the summer of 1981, Heinz Pagels and I uh, wrote this paper, which was published uh, in FizRev Letters in 82, where we proposed that the lightest supersymmetric partner particle was a natural candidate for the dark matter. And uh, later on, uh, Steigman and Turner uh, called this weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs, a uh, very clever acronym. Uh, so uh, many people thought the early universe was gonna be extremely complicated. Uh, Jerry Ostreicher was invoking larger and larger explosions to push matter around uh, as we discovered larger and larger voids. But uh, Jacob Zeldovich assumed that it's fundamentally simple with a scale-free fraction spectrum of adiabatic fluctuations. Initially, he just considered ordinary matter when uh, the cosmic background radiation upper limit became 10 to the minus four, delta T over T, and Moscow physicists, Lubimov et al, uh, thought that they had discovered neutrino mass, uh, they were briefly pushing the idea of hot dark matter, that is light neutrinos as the dark matter. But uh, it turned out, so this is the, the key paper by them, a nature paper, Zeldovich, Einisto, and Shandaran, uh, Einisto, of course, is still in uh, Estonia, and uh, Sergei Shandaran is, has been for many years at the University of Kansas. Uh, but uh, so that that's their uh, picture. Uh, George Blumenthal and I thought that the Zeldovich approach was very sensible, but we tried other simple candidates for the dark matter. Uh, first, uh, what we now call warm dark matter, and then with uh, Sandy Faber and uh, Martin Rees, cold dark matter, and we always use the phrase that it moves sluggishly in the early universe. Well, uh, some of you know that the banana slug is the UCSC mascot. We actually have these little creatures living on our campus. And uh, so this is a reference to uh, the UCSC mascot, the sluggish dark matter. Anyway, so there's our, our warm dark matter paper, uh, following up on the paper by Pagels and me. Uh, so George uh, was a cosmologist, and uh, so he helped us uh, figure out what the consequences would be for galaxy formation. And uh, Jim Peebles responded to this paper. You can see uh, the reference there uh, with his paper where he took the limit of the mass becoming very large. Uh, so that's cold dark matter. And uh, because of the early reference to our paper, uh, George Blumenthal was actually the referee of this paper. And uh, George and I uh, saw that Peebles had made two serious mistakes. Uh, one, he left out the neutrinos completely, so he had uh, matter dominance occurring at the wrong time, but he also hadn't done the calculations correctly. Nevertheless, uh, we decided to accept the paper and uh, then do the calculations correctly ourselves and work out the implications. And this is the paper that probably was the single biggest reason that Peebles got the Nobel Prize for basically creating modern cosmology. But I think he did deserve it. I can't think of anyone who deserved it more except Zeldovich, who of course died uh, in 1988, so no longer available. Uh, and uh, on the right-hand side uh, of, of this, I show you the cover of Peebles' 1980 book, The Large-Scale Structure of the Universe, where he really lays out the foundations of modern cosmology. 
And uh, I think the Nobel Prize is an indication that uh, the general uh, physics community agrees now that modern cosmology is a serious subject. Uh, so this is the paper that uh, uh, we wrote. Uh, I was actually the one who wrote this paper, uh, although we put the names in alphabetical order. And uh, we proposed that cold dark matter is uh, the main form of mass in the universe, that it has a Zeldovich spectrum of primordial fluctuations, uh, which is scale invariant, that is the amplitude crossing the horizon, uh, crossing inside the horizon is always the same. Uh, and uh, we also, in the paper, concluded that the data favors, we, we worked out two different versions, omega matter equals 0 0.2, which we thought is the lowest possible plausible value, and omega matter equals one. And uh, we said the data certainly favors omega equals 0.2, but you couldn't rule out omega equals one. And uh, we pointed out that this theory is in very good agreement with many observations. And it deserves to be tested uh, against many, many new observations. And of course, that's what's happened. So here's the key idea uh, of the theory. Uh, Look at the graph on the upper left. What's being plotted is the log of the scale factor A, that's one over one plus Z, on the horizontal axis increasing to the right. So time increasing to the right and time since the Big Bang. And then uh, on the vertical axis, it's delta rho over rho, the uh, fluctuation amplitude. And uh, what you see is that these fluctuations of different mass scales 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9 solar masses, 10 to the 12, 15, 18, 21, they all cross inside the horizon. That's the uh, horizontal dashed line. They all cross inside the horizon uh, at exactly the same amplitude. That's the so-called scale invariant spectrum. That would correspond to a primordial spectrum as a function of wave number k going as k to the 1, k to the first power. The best estimate from uh, standard lambda CDM fit to the cosmic background radiation is k to the 0.96, so very close to one. Anyway, uh, if fluctuations cross inside the horizon when matter is dominant, they grow as fast as possible, which is linear with the scale factor. That's the right-hand side of the diagram. But if they cross inside when the universe is still dominated by radiation before a redshift of about 3,500, then they only grow logarithmically because there's a general fact that fluctuations only grow rapidly in their, when they're in the dominant component of the universe. The consequence is that the fluctuations pile up. The 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 solar mass fluctuations have similar amplitude. And so on the right-hand side, we plot the cold dark matter spectrum and then also hot dark matter and white noise. And you see how flat the cold dark matter spectrum is on low masses. The Milky Way uh, halo is around 10 to the 12th, of course. Uh, and only when you get above cluster masses, 10 to the 15 or so, uh, does it start to fall off more rapidly. That's that curve I showed you right at the beginning of the talk. And uh, now you understand, uh, of course, if you study cosmology, you learned this long ago, uh, why this happens. And it has to do with when fluctuations cross inside the horizon and how rapidly they can grow. So George and I were the first ones to work this out correctly, I think, in 1983. And that was the basis for our 1984 paper and also the extensive lectures I gave on this at the Brenna Summer School in 1984. So uh, what this picture shows is, uh, click again to get the, uh, uh, the blue curve. Uh, so the, black, the, the green curve is just earlier calculations, Reese and Ostriker, Silk, Vinnie, and White and Reese. And that's the log of the gas density versus the variable velocity. And inside that inverted uh, thing uh, is where the gas can cool rapidly and structure will form. Gas cools faster than freefall. But uh, the blue curve shows where the fluctuations are and uh, that's the cold dark matter theory. And what it shows is that galaxies would form in halos from 10 to the eight to 10 to the 12 solar masses and that's with primordial composition. With uh, metals, you can get uh, a little bit more massive galaxies. 
Uh, and uh, that's, of course, correct. That, that was the first time we understood the origin of the mass of galaxies uh, from cold dark matter plus the cooling curves. Uh, I wrote other papers in these early years. This is uh, on the detection of cosmic dark matter and basically all the modern ideas, at least for uh, cold dark matter and axionic dark matter, uh, another version of cold dark matter, uh, are, are, just, are summarized in, in our early paper. Uh, we also worked out uh, in 1991, the other effects besides making the universe expand more rapidly of a cosmological constant or dark energy. And in particular, that the rate of growth of perturbations falls off if the uh, lambda parameter is uh, larger. Uh, so, uh, in other words, uh, dark energy impedes growth of structure. And uh, we also showed that this would change the clustering, uh, for example, around clusters of galaxies. It would change where the caustics are. And all of these things are, are now actually uh, included in, in modern cosmology. But uh, this was the first paper that worked all those things out. Okay, well, now back to galaxy formation. So uh, we do large-scale structure simulations that show the large structure of the universe, and we usually leave out the baryons in these very large simulations. Uh, and then if we want to understand galaxies, we have to do hydrodynamic simulations. So first let me show you some stuff from the cold dark matter simulations. So this is uh, from uh, Volker Springle's Aquarius simulations, uh, what the dark matter halo of a galaxy the size of the Milky Way looks like. So there's the Milky Way, about 100,000 light years across. And there's its dark matter halo, which is more than 10 times larger in, in linear scale, so a thousand times more volume than uh, the visible part of the Milky Way. And uh, you see also all that substructure, and we're discovering more and more of the satellite galaxies that would live in the more massive uh, subhalos. How does this fit into the large scale structure of the universe? More or less like this. So uh, this is uh, a slide uh, of a thin slice of one of our big simulations that we call the Bolshoi simulations. Uh, these are uh, about almost 9 billion particles. The resolution is uh, a kiloparsec, uh, and uh, the volume is 250 H inverse megaparsecs. Uh, so uh, we've run these simulations uh, a couple of times. Uh, when we got the new data from Planck, this was based on the WMAP data, uh, we ran them again. And we've also run much bigger simulations that we call the multi-dark simulations. And Aldo uh, Rodriguez Puebla uh, played a major role in analyzing the simulations. And uh, Aldo and Vladimir Villariz uh, helped compare them to observations uh, using abundance matching and things like that. Uh, let me show you now just a thousandth of the volume of the Bolshoi simulation focused on uh, one of the massive uh, dark matter halos that would host a cluster of galaxies. So we're rotating this image so that you can see the three-dimensional structure. What you see is that the galaxy halos and the halos that host more massive structures, uh, groups and clusters, lie in these long filaments. And where the big filaments cross, you get the really massive structures. And in particular, in the middle of this diagram is the dark matter halo that would host a massive cluster of galaxies. Now, we keep track of every single halo at every time step, and we also see which halos merge to form the more massive halos. And what I'm going to show you now is just the halos that form that very massive halo in the center. So every halo that you see is going to end up in that one central dark matter halo of a massive that would host a massive cluster of galaxies today. You can see they flow in mainly along three directions, coming down from the top more or less vertically, in from the left-hand side, uh, and then up from the lower right corner. That's very typical, this uh, uh, three-way formation. 
Uh, you'll also notice that the more massive structures that form as they form, they tend to be quite prolate. We'll talk more about that. The more massive dark matter halos, thousands of them, would host galaxies. And in the cluster of galaxies, we will see those thousands of galaxies. So a massive cluster like the coma cluster uh, would form this way. Now, what I showed you took out the cosmic expansion. If we had included the expansion, then at high redshift, the object, the, the box would be very, very small, as in the upper left corner. And we wouldn't be able to see what was happening. So what we do often is to expand everything up to the present by just uh, increasing the scale so that it would be the same size as the present, but with all the structure as it would have been at those early times, those high redshifts. So that's called uh, moving in, working in co-moving coordinates. So what I showed you before was done in co-moving coordinates. And let me now show you the expansion of the universe in a region uh, about uh, 100 megaparsecs across, uh, again, in co-moving coordinates. So you see the filaments form very early, but mass flows along the filaments toward the denser regions where the filaments cross. At the same time, the halos are forming in the filaments, and the filaments are getting thicker. Okay, now the simulation is finished evolving, and now uh, we're just flying through it, so let me skip. Now, why do these filaments form? And uh, Zeldovich, working uh, especially with uh, the great Russian uh, mathematical uh, mathematician and mathematical physicist B.I. Arnold worked this all out uh, in the 80s. Uh, and this is uh, from one of Zeldovich's papers uh, in, a, in a review uh, of Zeldovich's work published in 92 after he died. Uh, and uh, the basic idea is that, so this is, what this is is actually an image at the bottom of a swimming pool. And you see these caustics, uh, which give rise to these sharp lines that all of us have seen in swimming pools. Uh, and uh, what happens to form the filaments is basically the three-dimensional analog of that. Basically, the first structures that form tend to be a one-dimensional collapse. And those make pancakes, or as Zeldovich would have called them, blini. The second collapses occur perpendicular to that, and that's what forms the filaments. And then the third collapses occur in the regions that are the highest density where the filaments cross, and those make the dark matter halos. So this is this uh, very linear structure uh, of the filaments is something that we've understood for a long time, thanks to this early work by Zeldovich. So uh, a sort of classic paper that explored the structure of dark matter halos was written by my two graduate students at the time, Brandon Allgood and Ricardo Flores, uh, published in Monthly Notices in 2006. And uh, what you see is a summary of halos of different masses at different redshifts. So mass on the horizontal axis and the shape, short axis over long axis, uh, on the vertical axis. So uh, if S on the vertical axis is large, that means that the halo is more or less spherical. By definition, A is the long axis, B is the intermediate axis, C is the short axis. Uh, and uh, what you see is that at high redshift, halos are all quite prolate. And especially the uh, highest mass halos that form at any redshift are the most prolate. They tend to form very prolate because they're forming along these uh, filaments mostly. And then as time goes on, uh, a given mass halo is seen to be uh, less prolate, although still pretty prolate. So that's the shape evolution, the yellow arrow that you see. And uh, on the right-hand side, I sketched what's going on. So at the bottom right, a high redshift halo accretes mainly along the filament on which it uh, forms. And it's not supported by rotation, but instead by anastrophic velocity dispersion. That is, uh, you've got 
dark matter and ordinary matter coming in primarily along the long axis. And uh, you have some going one way, some going the other way, uh, at least for the dark matter. And uh, it's that high velocity dispersion in that direction that supports these prolate halos. The velocity dispersion is less on the perpendicular directions because less material is coming in that way. But as time goes on, the filaments thicken and the accretion becomes more spherical and the halo becomes rounder. The center is still quite prolate. Now, how does this cause the galaxies to become prolate? That's the last topic that I'm going to discuss. And uh, so to understand that, we run these high resolution hydrodynamic galaxy formations, uh, galaxy formation simulations. And uh, that's what allows us to predict the evolution of galaxies and uh, what they look like. So uh, this is uh, a late time step from one of these uh, uh, simulations. And then I'm gonna actually show you the evolution of the simulation. Uh, it's gonna take a couple minutes, but I think I have the time now. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see the dark matter, uh, and the high density is red, lower density is blue, intermediate density is yellow and green. Uh, and you see that the stars on the right are following the dark matter. And uh, so very prolate, uh, except that this is a, a late times, uh, redshift two, and you see that the center is already starting to form a, a denser region uh, in the stellar center. Uh, so dark matter halos are elongated, especially near their centers. Initially, stars follow the gravitationally dominant dark matter, but later, as the ordinary matter becomes gravitationally dominant, the stars and dark matter distributions both become disky. So uh, now watch the evolution. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the dark matter, and on the right side, the stars. So this is a pickle-shaped galaxy. Now, in a minute, less than a minute, uh, suddenly uh, new things will start appearing. Uh, and what's happening is we're only visualizing a small volume. And it's not that the uh, thing that you're about to see has just suddenly materialized. It's just that it's come into that volume. Notice that the thing isn't rotating. Okay, there's, there's one of these objects that's come in. So this is now uh, another galaxy that's going to merge with the first galaxy. So it gets torqued into the filament. And now it's going to come right through along the filament direction. And now it's coming back and merging. And you see it's brought a fair amount of gas into the center, which is making some stars. And now the same thing is going to happen again. And uh, although I said this doesn't rotate, you see it does get torqued around as these uh, objects come in along the filament. So the filament direction is more or less uh, uh, horizontal. And now the center is starting to form. So now we're down below redshift two. And, and now we're getting more uh, uh, toroidal in the center. And the whole halo is actually starting to become rounder. And also, uh, we're starting to see uh, that the dark matter is also rotating. And now you see uh, that the whole thing is becoming much rounder as we get down to redshifts of about one or so. OK, so that's uh, several thousand time steps from uh, one of our cosmological simulations. These are zoom-in simulations with a resolution of about 20 parsecs uh, in the dense regions. And uh, this was from our paper uh, where we summarized uh, five of these simulations that had the lowest masses uh, at re low redshifts so that they were prolate. And you see uh, how the stars 
and the dark matter are quite highly aligned. So you see an edge on view and then a view down the principal, down the long axis. Uh, on the right hand side, what you see is that when the galaxies are dark matter dominated to the left side of the dotted line, that means the ratio of uh, ordinary mass to dark matter mass in the half mass radius uh, is less than what? In other words, more dark matter than stars. And uh, those galaxies are mostly prolate, elongated. But when the dark matter becomes less dominant, when the ordinary matter is the larger fraction, that's to the right of the dotted line, then the galaxies are primarily uh, not elongated, rounder, disky or, or uh, spheroidal. So uh, in, that was in our uh, paper in 2015, Severino, uh, Daniel Severino, who's now back in Spain, uh, me and Abishai Dekel, uh, in our paper led by Abishai's then postdoc, uh, Matteo Tomastetti, 2016, we uh, worked out the details of how the angular momentum works, the torques, and so on. Uh, and uh, we also showed that this pattern was seen in all of our simulations. Uh, the higher mass ones uh, went through the prolate phase earlier, and then they typically had uh, gas inflow forming a central uh, spheroid. Uh, when the mass exceeded about uh, uh, 10 to the 9.5 to 10 to the 10. So this is a summary of what the pictures look like uh, from our simulations. Uh, there are basically three stages, at least uh, in a simplified discussion. Uh, there's this prolate stage. That's the left-hand side that we call pre-blue nugget. Then there's uh, when gas flows into the center and the density is high enough, uh, the central density, the gas is mostly retained, even though there's supernova explosions, uh, and you get a central spheroid. And that occurs, as I said, when the mass in our simulations is greater than about 10 to the 9.5 to 10 to the 10. And we call that the blue nugget, uh, even though uh, often the centers are obscured by dust and they're actually rather red rather than blue, but blue means star forming. And then uh, the centers usually uh, don't form so many stars after that. And uh, most of the star formation occurs in a forming disk as more gas comes in at higher and higher angular momentum and forms a disk around the central spheroid. Uh, and so those are the three stages. And the upper row is showing you high resolution images uh, that you'd see if you could see these galaxies up close. But of course, these are early stages of galaxies. And uh, in the middle panel, we show what these galaxies would look like if Hubble saw them at about a redshift of two. So uh, Hubble is, of course, a wonderful telescope, but it's uh, only a, a two and a half meter mirror. And its resolution isn't so great especially at the longer wavelengths. And uh, so uh, you see that they're kind of fuzzy. Uh, now, at the bottom are three similar HST images. These are real images from Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, on the bottom left, you see one of these pickle galaxies. Notice, incidentally, that uh, uh, there's sort of clumps along the pickle. And then in the middle, you have uh, one of these blue nugget galaxies. But you can see the remnant of the pickle. That was there before. And then on the right hand side, you see uh, a more or less face on this galaxy. Now, uh, what we did to compare the simulations to the observations is we used the intermediate, uh, the, the middle uh, type uh, images. We used hundreds of thousands of images that we generated from our simulations. And we used those as a training set. We determined which stage the galaxy was in by just looking at the relative amounts of stars and dark matter in the center, uh, and, and also whether a starburst had occurred. And uh, so we classified the simulations into pre-blue nugget, blue nugget, post-blue nugget, and we marked the images that way. And we used that as a training set for the deep learning code. And after the code was trained, it was able, just looking at one image, to tell quite accurately uh, which stage the galaxy was in. And we then applied that to the entire set of Hubble images. 
and we saw exactly the same pattern. Uh, let, let me, I jumped ahead a little too fast. Uh, we saw exactly the same pattern, and uh, we saw that the transitions occurred at the same masses as in our simulations. In particular, the blue nugget stage occurs only after the mass exceeds about 10 to the 9.5 to 10 to the 10. And that's consistent with the fact that we don't see uh, disk galaxies with central spheroids until uh, they have masses of 10 to the 9.5 or so. The lower mass ones, the 10 to the 9 uh, stellar mass galaxies are almost always uh, disks with hardly any spheroid. Uh, so, uh, so this looks like uh, this uh, is pretty consistent with the observations. So that paper, uh, as I mark in the upper right corner, uh, it was led by Mark Werdas' company. I'm the second author. Abishai Dekho was the third author, and we published it in AppJ in 2018. So some concluding thoughts. Without dark matter, we wouldn't exist. With only the ordinary matter, the universe would be a low-density, featureless soup. Dark matter starts to form structure very early. Galaxies form within bound dark matter halos. Stars form within galaxies. Star to make the heavy elements, oxygen, carbon, and so on. Rocky planets formed from these heavy elements, and life began and evolved on at least one such planet, namely ours. So dark matter is our ancestor and our friend. But But science is much stranger than fiction. Before the discovery that most of the mass of the universe is invisible, no one imagined this. So what else remains to be discovered? And I think we have to have an open mind. Uh, it may be that the dark matter is complicated. It may be several different kinds of things. Uh, it may be that the dark matter is weirder than anything we've thought of so far. And there may be a lot of other weird things in the universe that we haven't yet discovered. So. Uh, the great thing about uh, astronomy is that the amount of data increases extremely rapidly, and it's a, uh, what's really true. Uh, we theorists can work out all kinds of things, but it's the observers who tell us which of the many things that could be there are really there. Anyway, uh, I have time to take a few questions if people are interested. Okay, well, questions? Hi, I'm Pepe Franco, and um, I really enjoy your talk. It was a beautiful talk. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I have a very basic question, Joel. Uh, what kind of equation of state did you use for dark matter in your simulations? Uh, Basically, uh, the dark matter particles only interact with each other reputationally. There's no other interaction. Also assume that they move very sluggishly, as I said, in the early universe. So the, the uh, initial velocities are very small. And uh, that follows either the fact that they're very massive, uh, or alternatively, if they're low mass, as in the axion uh, picture, uh, they form from very large structures and wavelengths are extremely large and correspondingly uh, the uh, momentum is small uh, so that's all we need to assume uh, and that gives us the cold dark matter the other crucial thing is uh, the power spectrum the primordial power spectrum and there it's a power spectrum that goes as k to the first power which as I mentioned uh, corresponds to uh, the same amount of uh, amplitude, uh, delta rho rho, RS, uh, as each different scale crosses inside the universe. And uh, that would correspond to k to the first power, k to the one. And, uh, the best fit for standards in the CDM is 0.96. The best fit, if you put in that little bit of extra energy uh, in the first uh, uh, about 20,000 years of the universe, just before matter dominance. Uh, and it turns out that uh, the best fit is uh, a power spectrum of about 985. And it may seem that 0.96 isn't very different from 0.985, but 
But it is. It gives you a lot of power on small scales, and that gives rise to early galaxy formation and uh, even early uh, cluster formation. So these are the kinds of things that we're working out now on more detail. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. More questions? More questions? Joel, uh, it's me, Vladimir. Uh, what is the typical mass fraction of the galaxies in this initial phase or pre-blue pre, pre, uh, nugget phase when the galaxies are uh, prolate? I think it's very small fraction yeah, of the present day masses. I'm, I don't, I'm not sure I understand your question. Basically, uh, you don't get a significant number of these blue nuggets until the stellar mass exceeds about 10 to the 9.5. What happens instead is gas flows into the center, but it's quickly blown out by supernova explosions. And uh, it's only when the central density is high enough, corresponding to a total stellar mass of 10 to the 9.5 to 10 to the 10, uh, that the gas is retained long enough to form a lot of stars and, and forming a central spheroid. Uh, central spheroids also form by other mechanisms. So these massive clumps of star formation occur with masses of 10 to the 8 or more solar masses. And those quickly end up in the center by dynamical friction on a time scale of one or 200 mega years. And then, of course, major mergers uh, bring a lot of gas into the center. Uh, and the centers of the merging galaxies merge. And then lots more gas comes into the center and makes uh, a, a massive uh, central starburst. So those are the principal ways. But there's also another method uh, that we see in our simulations. And that's counter-rotating gas flows. So uh, but none of these things result in a central spheroid that's very massive until the total stellar mass exceeds about 10 to the 9.5. And as I said, uh, that seems to be true also in the observations. Uh, when we uh, look at the, uh, the structure of galaxies that we see with Hubble. So, Jill, uh, what do you think about the expectation of inferring dark matter or um, detecting dark matter. So what do you think are the astronomical, the key astronomical tests the for the future? <laughs> well, uh, we, we have three methods that we need to uh, use to detect dark matter. And before we can say that we've convincingly discovered what the dark matter is, we have to see it essentially in all three methods. One is uh, we want to actually detect the dark matter particles. Uh, if they're Massive particles, they'll scatter off nuclei occasionally, and we'll see them in deep underground detectors. They're deep underground to shield them from cosmic rays. Uh, currently, the best is uh, the kilogram, sorry, the, the thousand kilograms, the metric ton of liquid xenon uh, in uh, the detector in the Gran Sasso laboratory. And there may be a similar detector called Panda X uh, in a deep underground laboratory in China. Uh, and uh, the detector that was called LUX, Large Underground Xenon, is being upgraded into a detector called LZ. And that will have over eight metric tons of liquid xenon in, the, uh, in a deep mine of the home state gold mine in South Dakota in America. Uh, and there also is a plan to upgrade the other detectors into a, a similar scale. And uh, that's an order of magnitude more liquid xenon, but it turns out that the sensitivity increases by about two orders of magnitude. It'll be about 100 times more sensitive. And that's probably going to be our best bet to detect particle dark matter, WIMPs. Uh, axions are a different story, and there's other methods of detecting those. And there are other candidates for the dark matter, including fuzzy dark matter. And there are other methods for detecting those. So that's laboratory detection of the dark matter particles. Now, uh, if the dark matter is WIMPs, then uh, when they interact with each other, they can annihilate. Each individual WIMP, if it's the lightest superpartner particle, for example, would be stable. But because uh, they have to the, the, be the lowest mass particle with a conserved quantum number called R parity, which is a multiplicative quantum number like parity in particle physics. Uh, but two such particles can annihilate into ordinary matter. And uh, we do see, indeed, uh, a great uh, 
flux of uh, gamma rays coming from the center of our galaxy with a spherical distribution, just as we'd expect from dark matter annihilation. Also, the amount of it and the, radi and the energy uh, are quite consistent with dark matter annihilation. On the other hand, there are other possible sources, uh, for example, millisecond pulsars. Uh, so we need to confirm that uh, the source is really dark matter annihilation. And uh, we may be seeing other uh, indications of that, for example, an excess of positrons nearby. Uh, so that's uh, astronomical detections. And then uh, the third is that if the particles are uh, of the kind I just described, axions or uh, the uh, uh, WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, for example, associated with supersymmetry, uh, we should be able to make them at accelerators if we have enough energy and si high enough sensitivity. The Large Hadron Collider has not yet seen them, but uh, we're now upgrading the Large Hadron Collider and its detectors to have a much higher intensity. Uh, so an event rate that will be an order of magnitude higher than we've had before, and maybe we'll start to see rare processes. It might be that the Large Hadron Collider simply doesn't have enough energy to make the uh, massive... Uh, uh, the, the strongly interacting uh, particles in supersymmetry, uh, the squarks and uh, the uh, uh, gluinos, uh, it, it could be that uh, we would need to build a more massive, a more powerful accelerator. Uh, and I don't know what the time scale is for that, if at all. But uh, it's only seeing all three of them that gives us a convincing uh, detection. For example, supposing that we see missing mass and energy indicating that dark matter particles have been made in the Large Hadron Collider. All that tells us is that they live long enough to get out of the detector, which is, of course, a fraction of a second, small fraction of a second, whereas they have to live the age of the universe and longer to be the dark matter. So, uh, so it's crucial that we see the same properties, the same masses, the same other properties of the dark matter particles, interactions, and so on, in all three kinds of uh, detection. And then we'll know for sure what it is. And uh, of course, we haven't seen any of them convincingly yet. So this is probably a fairly long-term uh, proposition. But who knows? A major detection may occur this year. <laughs> yeah. So quick question, because Joel, I think, needs to leave. Uh, Irene Cruz Gonzalez. Um, I would like to know if the onset of rotation in dark matter and the stellar component is at the same occurs at the same time in your simulation that you showed the last simulation um, it's a complicated answer uh, so uh, dark matter halos rotate but not very much uh, the standard way we characterize this is with a parameter that's called lambda and uh, one of the versions uh, which we introduced in uh, 2001 in uh, the second uh, PhD dissertation paper led by my former student, James Bullock, is the angular momentum J of the dark matter halo divided by MVR, where M, the mass, V, the uh, rotation velocity, and R, the radius, are all at the virial values. Uh, anyway, uh, lambda is about 0 0.03, uh, so not very large. Uh, and we used to think that it was the small amount of rotation, uh, which would also be shared by the ordinary matter, that led to uh, galaxies of different sizes. The higher rotation, the less that the dark matter and, and uh, less that the, that the uh, ordinary matter, rather, the gas, could uh, uh, fall in toward the center before it became uh, supported by centrifugal force, by rotation. Uh, so that predicted that there should be a correspondence between the rotation of the dark matter halo, higher rotation, leading to larger radius for the resulting galaxy. But when we looked at our simulations and other people's simulations, uh, this is a paper led by Fangzhu Zhang, J-I-A-N-G et al., published last year, uh, we found nothing like that. Uh, if you plot angular momentum versus the radius of the resulting galaxy, it's just a scatter plot. There's no uh, correlation whatsoever. 
And it's not just true in our simulations, it's true in other simulations. Uh, and I think other groups have found the same thing. So it turns out that uh, the small amount of rotation of the dark matter halo is not what determines the uh, radius of the galaxy. Uh, it actually seems to be more important when the uh, dark matter halo form and what its radial profile is. The deeper the central density, the uh, smaller the resulting galaxy. So uh, sorry, but uh, the answer is complicated. Uh, <laughs> The rotation is there at all stages, but uh, uh, it, it's only the gas that flows in, uh, typically after the central spheroid is formed, uh, that gives you uh, big disk galaxies. Uh, and how little disk galaxies form is, I think, still something that we need to understand better by running more simulations and, and comparing the observations. Unfortunately, it's harder to see the little galaxies in the distant universe. Okay, well, let's thank Joel again. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you for your questions and for your attention. Thank you, Joel. So uh, I understand that you need to leave, so. <laughs> yes, thanks. Thank you, thank you. We, we keep in touch. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.